Matos. This is GBC Radio Athens, and here is the news. With the royal wedding only a week away, excitement is building as preparations are in full swing for the big event. Given the Duke's well-known patronage of the arts, rumour has it that the festivities will include a play, although details are currently being kept secret. Also the subject of much speculation is the wedding dress. Over now to our royal correspondent, Daphne Diaphanous, currently waiting to speak to us outside the palace. Daphne, tell us more about... Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days brings in another moon, but, oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdame or a dowager, long withering out a young man revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philostrate. Stir up the Athenian youth to merriments. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing the injuries. But I will wed thee in another key. With pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be Theseus, our renowned Duke. Ah, thanks, good Aegeus. What news with thee? Full of vexation I come, with complaint against my child, my daughter, Ermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man has my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious Duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, Thou hast given her rhymes, and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung, with feigning voice, verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gourds, conceits, knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment in unhardened youth. With cunning, thou hast filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And, my gracious Duke, be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I to be in a shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will my virgin patent up unto his lordship, 
whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar, to protest for austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? That's scornful, Lysander. Uh. True, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine. And all my right of her, I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed, but my love is more than his. My fortune's every way is fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius is, and, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? A Demetrius, I'll about it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul, and she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, don't sin idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may accentuate, to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, what cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? For want of rain, which I could well allow them from the tempest of my eyes. Deny me! For aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. Oh, cross too high to be enthralled too low. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Or spite too old to be engaged too young. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Or hell to choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were sympathy in choice, war, death or sickness did lay siege to it, making it swift as a shadow, short as any dream. And here a man hath the power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. Oh, so quick, bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Yes, of course. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies followers. Aye, a good persuasion. Therefore, Hear me, Hermia. Mm -hmm. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. Oh. From Athens mm -hmm. is her house, remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, mm -hmm. may I marry thee? <gasps> oh. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. Oh. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in that place, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, there I stay for thee. Oh, my good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, <laughs> by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, <laughs> by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever women spoke. In that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Oh, keep promise, love. <laughs> oh, look, here comes Helena. Good speed, fair Helena. Whither away? Will you be fair? That fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are lodestars and your tongue sweet air, more tunable than a lark to a shepherd's ear. 
sickness is catching. Oh, a favour so yours I would catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, mm. is no fault of mine. None but your beauty, would that fault were mine. Take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Helen, to you, our minds we will unfold. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow night, uh, when uh, Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, mm -hmm. decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, uh, a time that lovers' flights doth still conceal through Athens' gates we have devised to steal. And in that place where often you and I upon the grass were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, <laughs> there my Lysander and myself shall meet. Oh. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee by Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food Tomorrow deep midnight. Oh, I will, my Hermia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Helena, <laughs> adieu, uh, as you on him. Demetrius dote on you. <laughs> Bye. How happy some o'er oh, other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he airs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, folding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. <gasps> I is, see. Is, is all our company here? What's this about You're then? You're best to call them generally man by man according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit through all Athens <gasps> to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess oh. on his wedding day at night. First good Penelope Quince. See what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors. And so grow at the point. <laughs> Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy oh. and the most cruel death of oh. Pyramus and Thisbe. Oh. A very good piece of work, I assure you, mm. and a merry. Now, good Penelope Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. An answer as I call you, Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready. Name what part I'm for, and then proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? Ooh. A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. <laughs> oh, that will last some tears in the true performing of it. <laughs> if I do it, let the audience look at their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole them in some measure. Rest to the rest, my chief humour is for tyrants. I could play an Israeli or a part of terracotta to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. And Phoebus' car shall shine from fire and make and mar the foolish fates. If this was lofty, 
No name the rest of the players. Uh, this is Ertley's Vienna. He's a tyrant's Vienna. A louvre is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Uh, Penelope Quint. Flute, you must take Thisby on you. <laughs> what is Thisby? The wandering knight. It is the lady that Dermot <laughs> must love. No, Faith. Every knight play a woman. I have a beard. Oh. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide me fierce man and let me play Thisby too. No. Well, I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisby? Thisby? I? Promise? Move a dear. Die, Thisby dear. And leave me dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute, you, Thisby. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Eh, uh, Penelope Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisby's mother. If I must. If Tim Snout the Tinker. You, Penelope Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Thisby's father. Father? But Snug the Joiner, <laughs> you the lion's part. Lion. And I hope here is a play fitted. Lion? Uh, have you the lion's part written? Uh, pray you, if it be, give it me. For I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. Will I roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me? No. But I will roar that I will make a juice here. Let him roar again. Let him roar again. <laughs> and you should do it too terribly. You would fright the duchess and the ladies that they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. Uh, that hang would you. hang us all. Hang e us. Every this mother's son. son. I grant your friends that if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. <laughs> but I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any suckling dog. I will roar you as for any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus. <sighs> For Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see on a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I, I will undertake it. Yeah, yeah. What beard were it best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in either your straw-coloured beard, oh, here we go. your t orange tawny beard, your purple and green beard. <laughs> or your French crown coloured beard, your perfect <laughs> yellow man. Oh, oh, some of your French oh, crowns man. have no hair at all. And then you will play bare faced. <laughs> but, masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to learn them by tomorrow night. Tomorrow? <laughs> and meet me in the palace gardens a mile without the town by moonlight. There we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dark with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of property such as our play once. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect, and you. At the Duke's head we meet. Enough, hold or cut bowstrings. Yeah. 
and jealous Oberon would have the child. And she, perforce, withholds the loved boy, croons him with flowers and makes him all her joy. And no, they never meet upon the green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen, but they do squirt. All their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I must take the shape of making quite, or else you are the true and neighbour sprite called Bobby Goodfellow. <laughs> are you not he that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk, and sometimes labour in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife churn, and sometimes make the drink bear no harm, mistly night wanderers laughing at their harm. Oh, that hobgoblin call you and sweet hug. You do their work, and they shall have food luck. Are you not here? Are you not here? Oh, I'll speak to I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest Oberon and makes him smile when I have fat and been fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal. Yeah. Sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab. <laughs> and when she drinks, against her lips I bob and on her with the dewlap pour of the ale. <laughs> the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. Sometime for three foot stool mistaketh me. Oh, no. Then slip I from her bum, <laughs> doon tumble she, and tear her cries, and falls into a cough. <laughs> and then the whole choir hold their heads and laugh, and laughing in their mouth, and sneeze, and swear a merrier oor was never wasted there. <gasps> Boom, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here's my mistress, would that he were gone. Little met by the light, proud Titania. But jealous, Oberon, fairy skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Tarry, rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. Why art thou here, come from the farthest step of India? But that forsooth the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress and your warrior, loved Theseus, must be wedded. And you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished, and make him with fair eagle break his faith with Ariadne and Antiope? These are the forgeries of jealousy, and with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which fallen in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the ploughman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and the crows are fatted with the Murrian flock. The nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green for lack of tread are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. We see the seasons alter, hoary-headed frosts in the far fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old heaths thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is, as in mockery, set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter, change their wanted liveries and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which and this same progeny of evils comes from our debate from our dissension we are their parents and original do you amend it then it lies in you why should titania cross her over on I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the child of me. 
His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarky traders on the flood, when we had laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big-bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait following, her womb, then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, be immortal of that boy, did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long here intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall chide downright if I longer stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. By the gentle puck, come hither. <clears throat> Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard the mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and huh. harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song mm -hmm. and certain stars shot madly from their spears to hear the sea made music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, mm -hmm. flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed. Mm -hmm. A certain aim he took at a fair vessel thrown by the west, <sighs> and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. <gasps> Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It mm. fell upon a little western flower, before milk-white, now purple with love's wound. Mm. Maidens call it love in idleness. Mm. Fetch me that flower. The herb I showed thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid, will make man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch <laughs> <laughs> me this herb, and be thou here again ere the Leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a gandle around the booth, yes, in 40 minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch. Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, or meddling monkey, or busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. Oh, but who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen here, and here I am, and mad I am, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get thee gone and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or, rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you, I do not 
nor I cannot love you. And even for that, do I love you the more? Oh. I am your spaniel. And, Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me, but as your spaniel, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. What worse a place can I beg in your love? And yet a place of high respect with me than to be used as you use your oh, dog. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. <laughs> you do impeach your modesty too much, to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not. To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege, uh, but that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night, nor doth this place like worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. And how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin. The mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger. Bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valour flies. I will not stay thy questions. <laughs> Let me go. Or, if thou follow me, do not believe it, I shall do thee mischief. I in the temple, the town, the fields, oh. you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. Oh. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed, and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave here, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. <laughs> ah, hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the noddy violet grows. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes. But do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Ah. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garment he hath on. Mm -hmm. Effect it with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. Ah. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Come now, a roundel and a fairy song. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices and let me rest. Spot is mixed with double tongue. Thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Mutes and blind ones do not belong. Come not near our face.
What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take, love and languish for his sake. Be it ounce or cat or bear, lion or boar with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest. It is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is Oh, fair enough. <laughs> you faint with wandering. <laughs> and uh, to speak truth, I've uh, forgot our way. <laughs> uh, we'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and uh, tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander. Find you out a bed, for upon this bench will I rest my head. <laughs> ah, one bench shall serve a pillow for us both. One heart, one bed. Two bosoms and one troth. <laughs> Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet. Do not lie so near. Oh, <laughs> take the sense, <laughs> sweet of my innocence. <laughs> uh, love takes the meaning in love's conference. Uh, I mean that my heart unto yours is knit so that uh, mm. one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchange with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single trove. And then by your side, no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. A Lysander riddles very prettily. <laughs> now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off. Oh, I understand. In human modesty, such separation may well be said to become a virtuous bachelor and a maid. <laughs> So far be distant. And good night, sweet friend. <laughs> My love ne'er alter till thy sweet life ends. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that fair prayer, say I. <laughs> and uh, then end life when I am loyalty. <sighs> mm -hmm. Here is my bed. Mm -hmm. Sleep give thee all his rest. <laughs> With half that wish, the wisher's eyes be <laughs> pressed. <laughs> <sighs> Through the streets have I gone, but Athenian found I none on whose eyes I might approve this lurous force in stirring love. Night and silence, who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despises the Athenian maid. And here, a maiden, sleeping soon on the dank and dusty gruden. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack love, this ill courtesy. Sure, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid, sleep his seat on thy eyelid, so awake. But when I am gone, for I must do what to Oberon. Nay, no, thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou, darkling, leave me? Do not so. Nay, on thy pedal, I alone will go. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she had the blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears, if so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear. The beasts that meet me run away for fear, therefore no marvel, though Demetrius do, as a monster, fly my presence thus. What wicked and assembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's sphery eyne? Oh, but who is here? Lysander, on the ground, <gasps> dead, or asleep. Uh, I, I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. Uh. Ah. 
hum and a hum and a and run through fire I will for thy sweet sake transparent Helena nature shows art that through thy bosoms make me see thy heart where is Demetrius oh how bitter word is that vile name to perish upon my sword uh, uh, do not say so Lysander so what though he love your Hermia lord what though yet Hermia still loves you then be content Content with Hermia? <laughs> no, I do repent the tedious minutes with her I have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena, I love. Who will not uh, change a raven for a dove? <laughs> the will of man is by reason swayed, and reason says that you are the worthier mate. Reason becomes the marshal of my will and leads me to your eyes, where I overlook love's stories written in love's riches. Oh, wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? It's not enough, it's not enough, young man, that I did never, nor, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye, but you must flout my insufficiency. Oh, good troth, you do me wrong, good sooth, you do, no. in such disdainful manner me to woo. But <clears throat> fare ye well. What? Perforce, I must confess, I thought you lord of more true gentleness. Oh! That a lady of one man refused should of another therefore be abused. Oh, oh. Huh. Uh. She sees not Hermia. <laughs> Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come at thy sand near, for as surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings, or as ties heresies that man do leave are hated, most of those they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit, and my heresy, of all be hated, but by the most of me. And all my powers address your love, and might to honour Helena, and to be her knight. Help, help, help me, help me, thy son, help, help me! Did I best have plucked this crawling serpent from my breast? Ah, oh, me, for pity, what a dream was here! Oh, Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Methought a serpent ate my heart away, and you sad smiling at this cruel prey. Lysander? What, you moved? Lysander, Lord! What, out of hearing? Gone? No sound, no word? Lack, where are you? Speak, and if you hear, speak of all loves. I swoon almost with fear. No? Then I well perceive you all not nigh. Either death or you I find immediately. 